it will help if I unmute. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, we are very happy to um, have this event today, it's the first in our series of equity, diversity, and inclusion in the Department of Medicine. I am very pleased to welcome our two speakers for today, and I will introduce them very shortly. Um, but first, I would like to do our uh, acknowledgement as we have been doing um, in the past few years. So as a reminder, especially under equity and inclusion umbrella, we need to acknowledge that IPUI stands on the land, homelands of the Miami people, and that it also displaced a vibrant Black community. Um, in Indianapolis. With that, let me stop sharing. So Dr. Mack can also start sharing. And uh, while she does that, I will introduce our speakers for today. So first we have um, Dr. Jackie Mack, um, who identifies as, as a first-generation student and as an ethnic Chinese Vietnamese woman. She's a visiting assistant professor of higher education at Northern Illinois University. Dr. Mack conducts research to examine race and racism in education, understand the effectiveness of higher education policies and practices, and advance institutional transformation towards equity. She has a particular um, interest and focus on racially marginalized students, such as Southeast Asian Americans and the institutions that serve them, also known as minority serving institutions. Um, Dr. Baraksi Yi is also with us today. Oops. <laughs> um, Dr. Baraksi Yi is a Cambodian American woman, daughter of refugees, and first generation college graduate and faculty. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Leadership at the Kremen School of Education and Human Development at California State University, Fresno, or most commonly known as Fresno State. She conducts research to advance equity, access, and opportunity for historically underserved communities, such as racially minoritized Southeast Asian American and refugee populations. So with that said, Dr. Mack, Dr. Yi, welcome to the Department of Medicine and I'll turn the Zoom to you. Thank you, Dr. Soto. Um, it's wonderful to share this afternoon with you all and share some time with you all. Uh, we're all coming off of different, but albeit similarly probably really tough academic years. Um, so I appreciate, um, Dr. Yi and I both appreciate you all taking time out of what is the end of a very tough academic year to be here with us and have this conversation. Um, the title of our talk today is Myths and Realities, the Prevailing and Multiple Forms of the Asian Exclusion in Academic Medicine. Um, Dr. Yi and I will kind of take turns. Um, you'll hear from both of us um, and we'll shortly share our agenda for the discussion um, and our talk today, but we'll start off by um, introducing ourselves slightly differently and sharing a bit more of a lived experience that's related to the topic we're talking about today. Um, so as Dr. Soto mentioned, my name is Jacqueline Mack, Jackie Mack, J Mack, any variations of that work. Um, I'm a first generation student, which means I was first in my family to go to college, first in my family to graduate, and also now first in my family to have a PhD. Uh, my identity as a daughter of refugees is really important to me um, and one that I came to discover over time um, for reasons that, that we won't have time to get into, um, but it's important for you all to understand where I'm coming from. Um, and part of that coming from space is that my family has experienced multiple generations of displacement um, as ethnic Chinese um, peoples, but as ethnic Chinese Vietnamese peoples in particular. Um, it's also important for you all to know that I'm a product of public school education. Um, and have been doing a lot of work both in practice, research, service work towards, um, but also studying racial equity, um, including a particular focus on Asian Americans and Pacific Island communities for a while now. The photo you see in front of you um, is from October 2020. Um, it was taken for my mom's 60th birthday, who is the beautiful woman in the middle of that photograph. Um, my mom um, was recently diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's, so about a year ago. Um, and it was just mere months before this photo was taken. And so any of you who have cared for a loved one with this terminal um, diagnosis um, or know someone who's cared for a loved one with this disease um, knows that it's a pretty devastating disease. Um, and there's all sorts of questions that we don't really know about it, um, which fuels how devastating it can be. 
for me, what for me and my family, what's been one of the most frustrating, but not surprising discoveries in this whole journey as we're trying to figure out how to navigate life post diagnosis is how little culturally relevant support structures and resources there is for a disease that impacts so many people and so many within the AAPI community, the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Um, and these culturally relevant support structures include things like in language support, include um, translated material so that uh, my parents and other extended family members can engage and learn about what's happening with my mom. Um, so all that said, without some of those structures, my siblings and I um, have had to continue serving as cultural brokers and translators for our family during this time. So while we're learning about the disease, we're also translating for our, pa our parents and our family members. And that's an experience that we've had throughout our life um, and throughout our uh, educational experience. Um, outside of that, the, only, the primary source of cultural relevant services that I found and hung on to like it was gold and for dear life um, was actually a series of services provided through a federal, uh, federal grant funded program at um, the Chinese American Service League, which is based out of um, Chinatown here in Chicago. Um, I'll come back to a little bit to why I share this uh, story a little bit later in our conversation, but I wanted to uh, hand things over to Dr. Yi to share a bit more about herself. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, um, in front of you here, I have a photo of my grandmother, uh, Kia Sien. Um, she, this is on the day of my wedding and this actually was the only picture I ended up having with her. And um, I show this photo and I think Dr. Mack has shown her photo of her family just to um, help maybe folks understand our entry point into this topic, right? The, um, the connections we all have related to health um, concerns for family. Um, and I also show this photo to highlight that I never show up alone or as an individual. I show up collectively um, and I bring my family's experiences with me. So as a child of refugees, as a Khmer American woman um, and scholar and researcher focused on access and opportunity for Southeast Asian American students, um, and looking back at my experience and my family's experience with access to healthcare, I can't help but reflect on um, you know, my grandmother's experience and how I watched and, and served as caregiver for her as she had to deal with um, um, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, brain a brain tumor at some point, kidney failure and congestive heart failure, congestive heart failure which in the end was took her from us, in the end took her from us at eight. And so when I think back um, on um, her health journey, I think back I think number one, do I think back on the fact that you know she stayed with us so long despite experiencing trauma, despite experiencing a genocide in her country, coming to the U.S., experiencing scarcity, experiencing a culture of stress, right? Um, but she was able to live for so long and to fight for us not only because of her stubbornness and I think and her resilience, but because of her access to healthcare and her access to a Cambodian doctor, which is very rare for someone who spoke her language, who could explain her diagnosis to her, to just engage in these conversations about health, um, you know, while in a Western um, society, but navigating her own socialization as a Khmer woman, right? And so I tend to think, looking back at her experience, that she was able to be with us for so long because of her access. And so this is why I think we wanted to approach this topic from this connection to why this matters to um, our work. And so that's an introduction to my grandmother and her life. And let's move on to the purpose and agenda. So what is the purpose of our talk today? <laughs> Not just to introduce you to our families, um, but to really highlight the ways that Asian communities experience exclusion, right? Within academic medicine, and also to generate some movement for all of us collectively, individually toward inclusion and equity to serve and support Asian communities. And so what we're gonna be doing today is first, we're gonna start off with some assertions that we make as individuals, Dr. Mack and I, um, who do this work. Um, we're gonna do some group brainstorming. We're gonna go over three myths about um, Asian American exclusion. Um, we'd like to discuss what's at stake when we're talking about exclusion of Asian Americans and then some applications and some discussion with you all. So that will be the short agenda that we have. 
So we start with our assumptions, which frame how we collectively, both of us, Dr. Unite, approach this conversation, but also these are assertions that largely um, shape how we go about our work in academia, but also our lives. These aren't all the assertions, but these are some poignant ones that I think would be important for you all to keep in mind as we're talking. Um, the first is that we believed each person has an individual role and responsibility to advance equity. Institutions also have this responsibility, right? So it's not just an institution or just an individual thing, both folks, both entities have to show up to advance equity. We also believe that inclusion can't happen without understanding exclusion. So this is to push against um, any sort of belief that, oh, why can't we just be, all be included and, and focus on when we've been included? If we don't quite understand the ways that exclusion has happened, how it impacts people, um, what the larger consequences are, we won't really be able to also understand inclusion and the ways that we need to be inclusive of people. Um, Relatedly, exclusion isn't just explicit. It isn't just a close the door, you're not invited, you're not allowed to be here. It's also in, it shows up as omission and a lack of action. So it shows up as conveniently forgetting certain groups. It shows up as, oh, we forgot to email you. It shows up as something big happens in a community and nothing is said. It's just silent, right? That, those are also forms of exclusion. We also believe that exclusion does indeed hurt everyone and our progress towards equity. And so on the flip side, we believe that inclusion does indeed help everyone. Um, in some fields, exclusion is indeed a life or death matter. And finally, this is kind of a long one, um, but something that Dr. Unite spent a lot of time thinking about because of our focus on Asian, Asian American populations, and in particular Southeast Asian Americans, um, is that we believe that white supremacy has ensured a series of exclusions that result in a collective low literacy about Asian, Asian Americans. Um, meaning we collectively, both individuals who identify as Asian, Asian American and those who don't, we collectively don't really know that much about Asian American history, Asian American literature, these lived experiences that people have. Um, and in that low collective literacy, um, stereotypes and myths are allowed to prevail, are allowed to uh, shape lives and deaths. And so we kind of want to turn things over to you all. So we'd like to ask you to do, do some engagement work with us. Um, we'd like you to type into the chat any um, myths or assumptions you've heard or you've experienced related to Asians and Asian Americans. And this can be focused specifically within academic medicine or in the larger, um, the larger society. If a couple of folks wouldn't mind just sharing what you've heard or experienced, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Of course, you're good at math. You're Chinese, so ascribing intelligence to a specific group of, of people, right? Um, Asians are hard workers, work ethic, right? Um, that can't be a bad stereotype, right? <laughs> and we can talk about um, good and bad stereotypes later if we'd like. Um, they're smarter and harder working than other groups, similar to Michelle's. And Asians look so cute and petite. Yes. Um, that we eat dogs and cats, that we don't complain. There's a lot. Asian Americans are supposed to be the model minority, that we follow roles, that women specifically, Asian women are supposed to be quiet and respectful, work ethic. Asian Americans are white adjacent and do not wish to be involved in adequacy, right? Another important myth about Asian American activism or the invisibility um, of Asian American activism and only interest in STEM fields, Good question, what's the difference between Chinese, Japanese, and Korean? These are a lot. It's, so it's, it's very clear <laughs> that um, we, all of us as, as a group individually and collectively have some understanding of the ways uh, that stereotypes and assumptions function to, um, you know, make Asian, Asian Americans, Asians, Asian Americans um, hyper visible in specific ways. So thank you for sharing some of these. 
um, miss with us and keep them in mind as we move forward into the next section of our um, our talk where um, Dr. Mack will take us oh, start us off with some major myths about overrepresentation of Asian Americans. I was surprised, I guess not surprised. Um, one that I was thinking that would show up would be um, is related to, I think it's related to the don't need help kind of type of myth is that um, when there's an application for some sort of uh, program opportunity that's aimed at racially marginalized groups, the term of underrepresented, historically underrepresented, um, so, something that in not so many words says everyone but Asians can apply or we're looking for everyone else but Asians. Um, that is also something that I see that's also sometimes related to that omission that I was talking about earlier, but we'll get to that. Um, so I'm just going to add that in um, for you all to consider and keep in mind. So we're going to shift now into talking through this um, this topic of overrepresentation, but how a couple, um, in particular, three really core myths support this discourse of overrepresentation. Um, and this discourse of overrepresentation is used to exclude Asian and Asian Americans um, in, in general, in higher education, um, but also in academic medicine. Um, and we go, we're approaching this from the myths perspective um, because I think it's really easy to hear these things a lot and to read these things a lot, um, but by approaching it in this way and then for us to share what are some ways to counter these myths and we're also hoping you all develop or are able to take some notes about the language you might be able to use to dismantle um, this, these myths when you hear them or engage in conversation with your colleagues or whomever you're in a space with who are you sharing some of these myths. So the three myths include, Asians are overrepresented in academic medicine, all Asians are the same, and Asians don't experience exclusion, racism, hate, discrimination. Before I uh, go much further, you'll notice that Dr. Yi and I say Asian, Asian Americans, or Asian or Asian Americans interchangeably. Um, we're not using it interchangeably because we think we're all the same. Um, there are indeed different ways that folks who were not born in the US but identify um, along an um, Asian ethnic subgroup who come to the US, they're racialized differently, they might have a different experience, but some of it is very similar to those who um, are born in the US and are also socialized and racialized as such. Um, but in the exclusion of it, sometimes the exclusion does not differentiate where, where one was born, if that makes sense. So we'll start by this myth, which is that Asians are overrepresented in academic medicine. Um, our counter to this is that immigration policies and legislation, um, historic and current, encourage and discourage immigration of people from certain countries, from certain backgrounds with certain identities. Some examples from history. The Page Act of 1875. This is a slight history lesson for anyone who's interested in history. Um, pa the Page Act of 1875 was the first restrictive federal immigration law that was passed in the US. Um, oftentimes you hear the 1882 Exclusion Act, which I'll talk about in a second, but 1875, this Page Act was the uh, foundation that the 1882 Act built off of. And this legislation was named after the representative who introduced it. And um, this person introduced it to quote, end the danger of cheap Chinese labor and immoral Chinese women, end quote. There were several you know, elements to this legislation, um, but the, um, only the ban on East Asian women and particularly Chinese women, um, immigrants were, was most effectively and heavily enforced. Um, so you may also hear sentiments in this legislation that serves as a precedence to police the sexuality of immigrants, that serves to police which type of immigrants we want in our country. So this discourse goes way back. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 built on top of the Page Act, as I mentioned, and served to prohibit all immigration of Chinese laborers. Oftentimes we hear it talked about as excluded all Chinese people, not necessarily included all Chinese laborers, and it included, it still allowed for immigration of diplomats, teachers, students, merchants, and travelers. So certain types of Chinese folks 
the laborers were excluded and other types of Chinese folks were encouraged. I don't wanna say encouraged, but were allowed to immigrate. And this law wasn't fully abolished until the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. Can't do the math off the top of my head right now, but that's a long time before that law was abolished. And the, 18, the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act um, removed discrimination, racial and ethnic discrimination as part of American immigration policy explicitly. But it also created a seven category preference system that gives priorities for immigration, which includes um, family-based um, immigration. So family members and relatives of US citizens and permanent residents are encouraged um, or prioritized, I should say, or given preferences to, um, but also professionals and other individuals with specialized skills, which also includes medical professionals um, and refugees. And I, I share this historical context because this has shaped who is now, historically and now here in the country. Um, these three acts in, in conjunction with a couple of other um, policies led to large waves of immigration of, for example, Filipinas um, who filled a nursing shortage in the US for over 25 years. Um, of Indian and Chinese doctors, um, but also resettled South Asian, um, Southeast Asian refugees who continue to serve as registered nurses, healthcare technicians, care aides, nursing assistants, and other types of healthcare support workers. So when we talk about Asians are overrepresented in academic medicine, what do we actually mean by that? Who's overrepresented? In which service area? Which specialty? Which level of service? This slide pulls a chart of the applicants who identified as Asian and only Asian on their medical school applications and breaks the Asian group down by ethnic subgroups. We did try to look for a chart of matriculants, but I couldn't find one. So if anyone has that information, please do share with us. Um, some key things to highlight. So while I'm talking, I'll encourage you all to kind of digest some of this, but I'm happy to also share the link if you all wanna look at this a little bit later. It's a little bit more interactive on the website. Um, some key things to notice. The first thing is um, given my, sharing of the historical immigration context in terms of who's desirable and from where, from which countries, it's not a surprise to me necessarily to see that Chinese and Indian American applicants comprise the largest proportion of all Asian applicants. Um, and for, um, for context, um, individuals who are of Chinese and Indian descent make up the largest subgroups, ethnic subgroups of Asian and Asian Americans in the US. Some of the smallest groups um, are also likely those from refugee backgrounds. So notice um, Cambodian, there were 30 applicants um, in the 2018-2019 um, academic year. And for Lao, I believe um, there were 11 applicants, right? So much smaller. The third takeaway I wanna highlight is that we don't really know who's in this other Asian group. Um, that other Asian group is kind of like an, or it's the orange color, it's a 3.6% slice. Um, and that comprises over 400 individuals. And so there's some questions about who are we actually talking about when we're thinking and hearing the, the phrase or the myth of Asians are overrepresented um, in academic medicine. The second myth um, that we'll talk through is this one, Asians are all the same. And we saw some of that show up in the chat. Um, for this myth, oftentimes um, people talk about how diverse the Asian Asian American community is. Um, but so we're gonna try to bust this myth from a different perspective and seeing that um, when, 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 we, when it's perceived that the Asian community is a monolith, it's not so much that we are all actually the same, but it's due in part to the structures that mask the, that, that, that type of diversity. Structures meaning how we count and categorize people. Um, and I wanna start with uh, the US census and then talk about how it translates into academic medicine and how we categorize racial and ethnic demographics. Um, the race and ethnicity question on the US census has gone through extensive changes from census, from census to census. And for anyone here who's a data person, this change, between each census represents some glaring issues that we won't go into, but it's an issue. Um, I want to also give us a chance to look at something from the US census. Um, and I'm also happy to share this um, in the chat. 
for anyone who's interested in, in taking a look at this. Um, the US Census published this um, some years ago, and it shows how each race and ethnicity category has changed over time. And I want to um, have folks pay attention to the first time we ever, oh, sorry, this mouse, this whole, this mouse over thing is kind of blocking some, the view of some of these categories. But the first time that any person of Asian descent was captured in the US Census was 1860. Some might hazard a guess that that was probably some of the earliest moments of trying to understand how many folks of Chinese descent were, were in the country, but then also probably use some of that information to inform the subsequent exclusive um, immigration legislation. Um, and if we kind of like span over into the 1900s, you see that there are more um, ethnic subgroups that are added to the US census, which can be exciting. I'll get to that in a, in a sec. Okay. That whole purpose was just to show that how we understand race and ethnicity has, has not been static and has changed over time for a number of different reasons. Um, in addition to the categories having changed, um, how that data is collected has also changed. So historically, the US Census Bureau has hired enumerators to collect the data, oftentimes with little training. I'm happy to report that they're changing some of that now. Um, but what's really important to remember is that through the 1950 census, census takers would only look at the individual and make a determination of that person's racial or ethnic background. So through the 1950 census, someone would come to your house, look at you and determine your racial and ethnic background, even if you didn't necessarily identify that way. It wasn't until 1960 that self-identification was actually allowed. And if I go back to, to this, um, this website here in 1960, the options were quite limited, to be frank. So it was kind of exciting, right, that self-identification was finally allowed. Not necessarily. Um, it really wasn't until 1980 that categories for Asian and Asian American folks were expanded, but it wasn't until 1990 that disaggregated data, meaning that bigger category being broken up into specific ethnic subgroups was actually reported by the census, meaning we had the data, we didn't do anything with it, we the royal we. Um, and so today we're finally able to understand, to better understand how quote unquote diverse this community actually is. Um, so this chart, which I pulled from NPR, which some of you may have seen, um, or graph, I guess, um, this beautiful kind of dis graphic dis depiction, I don't really know what it's actually called. Um, we're only able to provide this type of data now because we're asking the question, we're allowing folks to self-identify and then we're doing something with that data. We still need to do better, but we've come a long way given where we've started. And bringing it back to the academic medicine uh, uh, space and Indiana in particular, I'm curious um, in the chat, for the first question, according to the US Census Bureau, what percentage of the population in Indiana identifies Asian and Asian American? Don't go Googling this. If you know, drop it into the chat or give an estimate just to kind of see where folks are landing. I got 5%, I got 10%, I got 15%, I got three, 10, somewhere between three and 10. In Indiana, the population is 2.6 as of 2010, 2.6. So this, my second question, what percentage of the IU or IU School of Medicine or IU health communities identify as Asian or Asian American? And in this estimate, please tell me if you're thinking it's IU in general, IU School of Medicine in general, IU health. Share some, ex, some estimates. IUSM, 1%, 10%, 10% at IU. Two percent. Luckily, we know something um, about this estimate. Um, I don't know that we've always reported this or made it public, but we now know. We know somewhat. Um, so a bit on the higher side than maybe we, we assumed. 
medical education students, Asian, Asian American students comprise 15.5% of medical education students, 4.8% of professional staff, 22.9% uh, tenure track or tenured full-time faculty, 20% uh, of residents and fellows, and chairs of 2.6%. I guess I should say it's a population estimate because they've had to adjust until we get the 2020 census. What's exciting about having that information is that we haven't always, we didn't always have it, right? Both as a society, but also um, when I, I should have mentioned earlier, I previously worked at the IE School of Medicine as a graduate assistant and have asked similar questions and this information wasn't always made publicly available um, for reasons that I wasn't always um, sure about. Um, so while it's still exciting that we have some of this information, I have follow-up questions. One of those includes, how does the IE School of Medicine or IU Health collect demographic information? Um, what does the actual question look like? Is it a, a select all that applies? Is it a, is it a fill in? Is it a, um, you know, what, what does the actual mechanism look like? Um, related to that is my second question, which is when Asian or Asian American is reported as a racial or ethnic group, and I should have mentioned that the report I shared is the 20, what was it, 2020, 2021 fact sheet that IU School of Medicine produced. When that's reported, do we know what that means, right? So if we go back to the previous uh, myth where we're able to know more about the diversity of the Asian and Asian American community because we have this aggregated data, if the School of Medicine is reporting aggregated data, meaning all the pieces of information together, do we really know what that means? Do we know who those students really are? Do we know more about their lived experiences? So my, my charge for IU is that excellent for, for including Asian and Asian Americans in reporting out data. I'm challenging you all to go a little bit deeper, to, to dig in a little bit more. And we'll, Dr. Yi and I will have some um, recommendations at the end um, for folks. Thank you. I'm going to end with um, a, just a brief uh, discussion of the final uh, major myth about Asian communities, and that is something some of you highlighted um, some variation of in the chat. And that's this assumption that Asians do not experience exclusion, racism, hate, or discrimination. Um, with the current context of COVID-19, um, uh, I, I think that we can acknowledge that this is an absolute myth and assumption given the rise of anti-Asian bias incidents in our country. Um, according to the Stop API Hate data, there have been over 6,600 reports of anti-Asian bias, anti-Asian incidents that range from very extremely violent acts that has taken lives to um, discrimination on the streets, harassment, um, spitting, right? And so we can um, recognize that there has been a rise. Um, not that it has never existed, right? Uh, given the exclusion that we see within the laws that Dr. Mack mentioned. However, it's much more visible than it was before, given um, access to social media and the mechanisms to track um, this information. The other thing I'd like to point out is that within academic medicine, and these are some uh, these are some statistics or data from re um, research articles that uh, we looked up um, in different studies related to um, bias incidents for that are experienced by academic medicine students. Right, so seventy out of seventy Asian residents reported being asked about their ethnic origins. Right. Um, we can imagine that maybe, maybe other groups or other residents, um, non-Asian um, residents might not be asked this information, this where are you from? Uh, or um, are you a citizen types of questions, right? Um, 69 out of 70 reported being confused for other Asian colleagues, right? Um, a, a, a microaggression uh, of not recognizing difference um, within uh, Asian American individuals. And in this study, Asian residents reported experiencing the greatest prevalence of being belittled and demeaned by patients because of their Asian identity. And so we can see here that 
um, the likelihood that Asian doctors and residents and students will experience bias from patients is very high. And so plenty of studies that highlight this within academic medicine. And then on top of that, we, you know, this connection to this idea of overrepresentation. Asian, uh, uh, Asian medical students are the second largest racial group, yes, within um, uh, medical schools. There are 20% of our medical faculty. And yet, as we go up higher in the leadership pipeline, you begin to see this dropping off, right, of representation, whereas only 10% of department chairs in academic schools are uh, identified as Asian. And then at the highest levels of deans and leaders of medical institutions, there's very little representation. And so what does this mean, right? Um, so there's clearly a, people like to call this sometimes a leaky pipeline um, of representation at leadership levels. However, leaky seems too passive a term, right, for, for this um, phenomenon. And so we have to think through, okay, well then, if there are not opportunities for Asian um, Americans to ascend to and take on leadership positions, where are their opportunities to influence policies, to influence decision-making, to influence how we are providing culturally relevant and culturally responsive care to our communities. Can we go on to the next one? Thank you. So in developing this talk, we wanted to have a conversation about what's at stake here, right? And, and I think many of you, as you've shared in the chat, have highlighted you know, experience or knowledge of the ways Asians are excluded in different ways, but we really wanted to highlight even further what's at stake and what are the implications of this exclusion, right? We recognize that exclusion operates unconsciously and consciously via different mechanisms, whether it's through behaviors, right, with how we treat people within our within the medicine uh, medical field, but also through policies and, op and also through laws, right? Exclusion operates very specifically in these ways. Uh, we have to recognize historical and contemporary exclusion, the different ways that it operates to shape the current lived context of Asian Americans in the US. And then of course, exclusion perpetuates ignorance, right, assumptions. And so what this does is it allows stereotypes and assumptions to fester, which then consciously or unconsciously shape policies and decision-making. And there are health implications for this about what assumptions are leaders making about Asian Americans and Asian communities that are shaping their, ac their, their future access to healthcare. And then of course, I think you know, we, we have to recognize that exclusion in general inhibits our ability as a society to serve the health needs of Asian communities in culturally relevant and responsive ways. And then the reality is uh, that lives are at stake here, right? Um, I'm tying us back to my conversation or my uh, introduction to you to my grandmother. She was able to live as long as she did despite all of the challenges she had and that and all of the, I guess you, uh, I'm learning the terminology. So her, so the social determinants of her health, healthcare experience because she had access to a Cambodian doctor. And so this is what's at stake in terms of how we can be better to, um, in terms of increasing Asian American representation and Asian American doctors in, in the health field. So lives are at stake here. Let's move on to the second piece. So we've been talking at you for a couple of minutes and I'd like you to maybe share, please, please feel free in the chat or if you'd like to engage with us in conversation, what reactions or responses are coming up for you as you're hearing this information um, and also potentially the second question, how do we make sense of this knowledge um, in your roles? Do you have any thoughts or reactions to what next steps you might consider? Feel free to type it or um, feel free to unmute if you'd like. Okay. 
It looks like they're soaking it all in. <laughs> I think at least for um, at least at least for me and, and Dr. Mack and I you know, have talked about this, um, the importance of disaggregated data. Um, and again, it, when we say um, Asian Americans are overrepresented in our school or in academic medicine, who exactly are we inviting um, to play in this field um, and really how that um, exclusion is really happening. So I do have a, a little bit of a visceral reaction <laughs> um, right now. And thank you so much also for the historical lesson there and the ways that this has truly been a systemic exclusion. So those are those are my comments, but I see a, a couple of individuals here also commenting and, and I invite them to unmute. Um, we are a smaller um, group, but mighty. So we actually have the time to, to engage in conversation. So I could make a comment or ask a question. It really has to do with the idea that institutions themselves often are, are not transparent about um, their own environments and not and often silence a discussion, a reporting, or often passive about taking actions. And I wonder if you are aware of any particular institutions that you think do a good job of this because I'm not sure our institutions do. I think that that's a common question. And, and I think the question, the spirit of the question comes from like, is there an exemplar? Like, can we envision something different than what is? And I think there are some institutions that are marginally better in terms of having better structures that are able to capture at the baseline, getting to know, getting a sense of who's actually at the institution, being more nimble about let's capture things like first generation status. Let's capture um, whether English, um, English was or is their first language so that we can, we can make, make these numbers seem more 3D, more three-dimensional. Um, you know, I, ha I have assumptions about who I think, you know, at IUSM, who, who are the majority of Asian ethnic subgroups who comprise the medical students, but I don't know for sure. And when I was a staff member, I asked, um, I asked anyone who was willing to entertain my question and we didn't have a good answer. And so I think a first charge, especially at IU, is to have some sort of answer when, when, when asked the question, um, so that it's so that it's a it's you know a more of a work in progress of actually here you know, for example here's how we're going to change our data collection system so that we're allowing for self identification here's how we're making meaning of it um, I I've heard all the time well we have to report it to the federal government in this way et cetera I understand that and if I know anything about the academic medicine field we are all very in into innovative and um, very willing to also do things in a way that makes sense for the field that's not just kind of in compliance um so i so i offer that um not to kind of shy away from the question about who might be doing it better but these are the practices that make it feel better um so having an answer when asked right that type of question would be important i think along those lines it's off it's making me think about my own experience at my institution i think this move like we're, we're getting better about just collecting disaggregated data, but I'm not quite sure institutions or organizations understand what to do with the disaggregated data, right? And, and what, how does that, what purpose does it serve beyond reporting to, you know, to meet federal regulation or for whatever accreditation reason, right? Um, I'm thinking about specifically my institution as, as, a, as a college and um, having a large population of Southeast Asian American students, given the geographic region, about 14% and half of them are Hmong. And there's data that indicates that they're experiencing severe 
educational disparities in terms of graduation rates. And consistently, nothing has changed. Nothing has happened. And so my question is then, what is the point of collecting the data if we are not using the data to make change? And, and one of the things that, are, that, that I am I'm kind of grappling with or coming to terms with, even for folks who are data oriented, even with the data, the assumptions and the stereotypes are prevalent and are so per pervasive that even when you're confronted with data, it's there's, the dissonance is so vast that it's hard to make change or to make decisions to reflect that data. And so that's something that organizations across the board, I think, are, are dealing with because of that dissonance with, we're not quite sure what to do with this data because it does not align with what my assumptions about Southeast Asian American or Asian American students are. At least in my experience, I can imagine that across the board, it might be functioning the same way just because organizations are very similar across the board. If I uh, may ask a, a question here, um, as well that came through. Um, what do you think this means for student affairs and, and support, student support, um, as well as faculty support? In terms of the way In that students are- our current population of um, medical students and, and faculty, um, the numbers that you show, especially on the faculty on the tenure track, mm -hmm. where, um, interesting <laughs> and then there's also of course the numbers around student um student affairs and support mm -hmm. i think i'll go back to i'll start and i think i'll um and i think um julie's comment about whether or not the current data collection systems allows for individuals to share or not share how they identify um share in a way that most aligns with how they identify maybe is a different way to to um to phrase it um i think with with numbers like that i would be very curious to hear from to ask these same questions of those student affairs um, professionals like what are what are and this is getting to um mm -hmm. some of our applications for allyship advocacy and solidarity is for those folks to ask themselves like who do they think they're serving um, what are the stories of the students that are in their classrooms or coming across um, in their virtual or physical meeting spaces as needing support services? Um, and without, without knowing some of those lived experiences, even playing with the actual data you already have. If you have a program that's about um, outreach and you get a sense of which type of students are participating in that outreach program or which type of students are seeking help putting together their um, residency applications, um, for example. And you notice, actually, I've only, I have only served, of, the, all, of all the students I've served, I've only served 10% students who identify as Asian, Asian American, but I know that they're 15% of the medical school population. So that's interesting. So let me dig a little bit more. All right, so this gets into the who. You know, who is who is centered, who's included, who's excluded, who's participating in whatever programs, services, mentorship opportunities, et cetera, who's actually um, participating, who's being centered, um, who's actively included, who might be passively excluded or omitted. Um, for faculty to also consider, um, we know, um, particularly in academic medicine and also in higher education in general, there's a lot of, of, of resources and access to resources that are based on relationships. There's a lot of shoulder tapping. There's a lot of, oh, you know, I know this student who's going to be fantastic at this. And then we end up providing the same set, the this, this same group of students, more of the opportunities, right? So for, for, for faculty to think about pausing and thinking of who are, who are they actually thinking about and are they recommending the same people over and over and over and over again? And maybe that's a signal to expand who you're getting to know in terms of the students that you work with, the learners that you work with. Um, I'm just going to finish talking about this since I started talking about it, and then we can kind of um, talk through some other questions. Um, thinking about what assumptions are you, are we, um, as an institution, making to inform decisions and policies? 
Um, what are assumptions that need to be explored and unpacked? So I think this overrepresentation one is one that's probably really timely for the school to really unpack at multiple levels. Because um, even the, if I flip back to this table, um, I'm not sure that the Asian students, Asian Asian American students who are in the medical school are the same type of Asian Asian American students uh, or Asian American um, faculty members, Asian Asian American faculty members. We can't assume that they're the same type of folks who are making it through that pathway, right? Um, so what, what assumptions are we making? And then the last piece is about context. So which contexts are shaping your assumptions about Asian and Asian American communities? Oftentimes, and this gets at someone else's question, um, the folks who are based in the community, who are running community clinics, who are doing volunteer-based work, um, community engagement type work, have a much better sense of who the Asian Asian American community are. Um, and there's always so much to learn from folks who are based in those types of contexts. Um, and just because you're in a, in a discipline or in an office or on a floor in a building or on a part of campus that you just don't see very many students, you don't see very many Asian or Asian American students, does not mean that they don't exist. And if you see a lot of them, it doesn't mean that there's too many of them either. So the question about which contexts are shaping your assumptions about the community are also really important to unpack and dig into a little bit more. Thank you, Dr. Mack. Yeah. Um, there are a couple points. I don't think I, um, I think there's a point about how the role of geopolitics informing um, mm -hmm. a lot of this context. And my short answer is yes, it influences all sorts of, all sorts of current contexts. Um, I can say that I, I and my family are here in the US because of geopolitical contexts. Um, we are here because of the wars in Southeast Asia that, that caused a lot of displacement. Um, and I'll just stop there because I can probably go on and on for some of that, but there is definitely a role. There's a, there's a role in the types of rhetoric that we hear and, and, a, and a conflation of China with Chinese folks, with Chinese Americans. It is, it is a sensitive subject. And when we think about it, um, as Dr. Yu was saying, that lives are at stake here lives and deaths are being shaped by some of these things, it's sensitive, but it's really important that we grapple with it with a sense of courage, um, with a sense of bravery to look at it, if, even if it makes you uncomfortable. Um, yeah. Dr. Yee, anything to, you wanna add or any question? I know there were a couple of questions that we probably couldn't get to, we, I didn't get to, but I wonder if there are others that stood out that you might be wanted to talk about and mention. There was actually a um, private uh, a direct message, uh, Dr. Yi, if, and if you can briefly um, explain the model minority myth um, for those um, in Zoom meeting that, that would like a little bit more of an expansion on the topic. Well, that would take a, a very long time because it's a very complicated, complex stereotype and assumption um, that has a lot of historical and contemporary manifestations. But in general, I think folks have already mentioned some of it or some variation of this about Asian being good at math or being hard workers or not experiencing ex exclusion. And so all of the myths that we actually talk about reinforce this idea of the model minority myth, right? Um, but we often don't recognize that the model minority myth was um, a construct developed to pit, uh, to essentially elevate a specific type of minority or acceptable minority, a uh, minoritized group, right? And often in, um, uh, what's the word? In contrast to typically black or brown populations, specifically black populations. Um, it came out of, uh, you know, during the, uh, the railroad, um, the railroad workers, um, it was often uh, the sentiment shared was that, you know, Chinese workers are more hardworking than um, African American uh, laborers, which who were slaves, right? <laughs> and so um, this idea that we are uplifting this a specific type of minoritized group instead of another. And so we can recognize as well, it has shaped um, how communities engage with each other, especially minoritized communities as well, that we haven't 
we don't have time to really talk through. However, it does shape um, how individuals interact with each other, how organizations and institutions and systems, for example, um, legal, educational, the law system, I mean, you just said that, um, how that is influenced by the stereotype and who gets access to what because of that. So it's just some, I hope that made some semblance of sense, but um, Dr. Mack and I, um, we've done a couple, uh, we've written a couple of um, articles, one major one on the model minority myth, and we can share that with folks as well. Dr. Mack, did you have anything to add on that? I, th I think um, the only thing that I'll, I'll add, and you may have already mentioned it, but I want to echo is that it oftentimes is similar to the way that we presented overrepresentation as like this overarching myth. And then we have these kind of like threads that come out from underneath it. The model minority myth serves in that kind of same way conceptually. And one of those um, mechanisms is actually something that Jia Jiang wrote in the chat, which is, you know, are, are Asian Americans just silent about these things? Are they not comfortable to, to, to speak out? Um, I'll, admittedly, there are absolutely individuals who are not comfortable talking about something that's happened to them. Um, and in a, in, a, in a society where one is routinely erased from the story, one is routinely invisible, one is routinely not counted, um, it's understandable to, to, it's understandable if someone of Asian descent experiences some sort of exclusion and doesn't feel comfortable speaking out if they've been erased and ignored and omitted in all sorts of other ways. Um, and on the flip side, um, there are a lot of Asian and Asian American folks who are quite vocal, who are quite willing to speak out and, and share some of these things that are happening um, and have long been doing so. Right. So while we talk about it in a particular context within um, the pandemic that has heightened some of this, um, we, uh, there's a long history um, that we can't cover today, but we're happy to talk about it at some other time um, of, of Asian Asian American folks who have been in solidarity with other social movements, who've supported other social movements, but who've also um, been leading and at the forefront of really important um, societal level type changes but has been erased because of, you know, some of the historical context I was talking about. So it's oftentimes, it, it actually as a myth, even if it's quote unquote positive, it doesn't serve anybody really um, outside of upholding white supremacy, right? Like Asian folks don't actually benefit from the model minority myth. Um, not sure if I'm allowed to say that, but I just did. <laughs> you just did and it's actually recorded so you know it's all good so i want to acknowledge um time uh it's it's five o'clock here so i want to thank you all for joining us but especially dr yeast and dr mack for um really spending the time with us this has been wonderful and i wish next time we have you it's actually in person <laughs> So um, I you. assume also that you're more than happy to answer any questions that may come up your way via email. Um, and I look forward to seeing everybody at July's event. Thank you. Again. Thank you, everyone. Bye.